This episode of the What If Podcast is brought to you in part by Button Poetry, where poetry isn't dead. As the premier place online for live performance videos of spoken word and slam poetry, Button Poetry won't bore you like your high school English textbooks did. Find real stories you'll want to listen to and art you'll actually care about by visiting them today at buttonpoetry.com. Hey, everybody. Yo. Yo. We need your help. Please. Uh... We, we don't mean to ask for your help too much, but man, if you guys have gotten an ounce of joy out of the show, uh, we would love just an ounce of effort back from you. It'll take you like 30 seconds at L- the very most. Literally. I looked at this survey. Uh, if you go to whatifpodcast.com slash survey, it just wants to know like five or six questions about you. We promise um, we're not going to sell it to anybody or do any weird creepy shit with it. No, nope, Nobody's even going to email you. You just have to have an email to prove that you have an email. That you're not a robot because robots can't make email addresses apparently. Right. Um, it's just a quick survey to give us, me and Spencer, a little bit more information about who y'all are, who's listening to the show. Um, and it helps us to potentially have advertisers that uh, you guys will like in the future that aren't things that will make you annoyed. Like, why well, you guys advertising for baby bottle companies? I don't, well, I don't need we a baby We get it, bro. Blue Apron. Okay. Yeah. Fucking Blue Apron. <laughs> I got it. I've heard We're that. We're not going to do that. I've heard 70,000 podcasts. Or we might, and then whatever. And then also just we'll go. We'll be rich and make more podcasts <laughs> for you, so it'll be fine. If you go to whatifpodcast.com slash survey, it would really help us out a lot. Really, it just takes 30 seconds. You can do it from your phone. I checked, so if wherever you are right now, I'm sitting on the bus or sitting on your weight bench in between sets, getting your juice on, just uh, head over there, answer like five questions, and it would super help us out a lot. And uh, tweet us at whatifpod when you do, and we will make sure that we tell you thank you to your face because we love you and we appreciate you. I promise one dope Simpsons gif per tweet. Yes. Ooh. Ooh. That's your reward. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) All right. Uh, so yeah, whatifpodcast.com slash survey uh, would help us out a lot. Thank you guys so much for your support and for listening to the show. Speaking of which, let's get it started. Here's the show. Welcome to the What If Podcast with your hosts, Spencer Worth Davis and Ryan Copperood. Hey, dude. Hi, Spencer. What's happening? How you is? I'm doing all right, man. You got Spencer shaved his head. Yeah. Not like skin shaved his head. It's fuzzy. He got the summer buzz. Nice. Yeah. It's getting hot out. I felt the fuzz as soon as I got into the studio because rubbing bald heads is like a is a favorite of mine. Cool. (laughs) I mean, I used to have the buzz cut, and now uh, for those of you who don't know, I have like the anti buzz cut. (laughs) I have the anti buzz cut. I have like collarbone length hair now for the first time in my life. So. Uh, Proud of you. That's quite a journey. Uh, hey, man, it's been it's been it's been a long time coming. You've been here for all of long, it. wild ride. <laughs> um, what's up, man? What did you do yesterday? Um, uh, yesterday was Sunday, um, bro. I cleaned everything in my home. I hit like the master reset button. I did my laundry. I vacuumed, bro. What were you wearing? Uh, that's a weird question. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a tweet the other day that was so me. It was like, no, seriously, what were you wearing? I don't know, like gym shorts and shit. Well, just be more specific. Uh, gym shorts and a beater. Why are you asking me this, bro? I'm trying to. We're we're talking about memory. I'm trying to see how much people remember about <laughs> shit. Um, I was doing this myself earlier. I was trying to. Our question okay. is, what if you couldn't forget? By the way, what if you couldn't welcome forget? to the What If Podcast with Ryan and Spencer. Um, okay. So I was wearing, I was wearing my black Nike gym shorts. I was wearing a white, uh, beater and I was wearing a backwards Nike hat while I did my dishes and vacuumed my house. What time did you wake up? 10. Oh, damn. 10, 15. Okay. Okay. What'd you eat for breakfast? I didn't eat breakfast yesterday. What'd you eat for lunch? Well, I shouldn't say that. Wait, did I eat breakfast yesterday? Oh, shit, man. You got me already. I had... Oh, I ate a... um, I ate a... What are they? A cliff Bar. Okay. And then I had a juice. Ooh. Because my girl came back from yoga, and she likes to get... Yoga nice, juice. Nice yoga juice. So I Gross. ate a yoga juice. Yoga juice sounds disgusting. <laughs> they don't wring it out of the mats. They sell it Ugh. in another location Ugh. and they put carrots and ginger and like healthy stuff in it. Um, 
My it's yesterday like a, memory is pretty good, bro. What'd you do last Sunday? It's Monday night, by the way. Hi. Hi. We're a day behind you. Yeah. I hope Tuesday went well for you. Yes, we do. Um, yeah, see, it starts to get fuzzy pretty Dude, quick. I would have no clue. I don't even know. Like Saturday, maybe I would know. Friday, I have no chance. Who in your life has the best memory? My wife by a mile. And how it does this... Uh, how does this take shape on like a regular basis? Uh, it's usually helpful. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can never like win any argument or like any, anything like that because she just remembers everything that ever happened or was said. I she, also, she's to the point where like, if you said, Hey, what did you wear? Uh, two weeks ago, Thursday, she could probably tell you. I also feel like... What um, did you do the summer of 1992? She could probably tell you. I also feel like I know your I know your wifey well enough that even if she didn't know, she would be very convincing in her ability to well, tell you. There's that coupled with the fact that I have just the most trash memory of anyone I know. You just instantly defer. You're like, you probably remember better I than I do. I know that I'm wrong most of the time when it comes to recalling anything that happened yeah. ever. Um, I don't like... What year things happened, who was there, yep. Yep. none of that. I'm just garbage. Bro, I'm the same way. One of my oldest and best friends, Nick Mested, who you know, shout yeah. out to Nick Mested. Uh, he, this fool will remember things about... One time we were out to beers once, and <clears throat> he remembered... Out to beers is a phrase I've never heard. That's nice. We were out to beers. Yeah. And and he, and he remembered details like you're from going my, out to pasture. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> except our pasture is alcohol. And he still might die. <laughs> <laughs> Just a field of Fulton. Mm. Um, he literally was remembering details from my third birthday party that yeah. I have no memory of. Yeah, he was like, he was like, oh yeah, well that was that was the year uh, the year that we were in third grade together was uh, well we would have been nine and ten because that's the year that M- the Muppet Pirates movie came out and we went to it for your birthday and I was like oh, I don't even remember that third dude. grade you said third birthday party at first oh my bad sorry memories from in, three would be a little more intense that would be super intense I my first memory I have one memory before before age like eight and it was my first day of preschool. Because I went to get a, a name tag, right? It's the first day of preschool. You got to go meet everybody. And like my mom had just dropped me off and just left. And it was like my first experience with a teacher ever. I'm getting the cutest like vision Dude, of preschool I'm gonna, okay. age, Spencer. I'm going to put a picture of yes. my preschool. Like I, it probably wasn't a yearbook, but that for some reason I took a picture in preschool. I was wearing a cardigan with a bear sewn onto it. Pro. I'm how, putting a picture in the show notes. Yeah. I'll how, do have, it. how have you not like, how has not every album art you've ever done? Not <laughs> just been that picture over and over again with a new title. Um, so my first time, like really being by myself at school, going with the teacher and she's like, we'll get a name tag for you. And it was one of the old school, like plastic. You slide the paper sheet into the plastic thing and it's got the safety pin enclosure oh, yeah, on the sure, back. Sure, sure. It like folds into yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. She goes to stick it through my sweater and just stabs me in the chest with ah! it. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> and that was the moment that I like came online as a human being. That was my first, that's my first memory. And I think from that day forward, I was like, school is fucking dumb. I, I hate this place. Teachers are evil. I've been here for five minutes and I've been stabbed. You stabbed a four year old. I, <laughs> I was, I was like a small part of me was like, is this story end with Spencer taking the name tag out of his chest and then stabbing his teacher back with it? Because that seems like something you as a person would totally do. Stab people? Thanks, bro. At four-year-old Spencer getting poked with a needle would totally be like, you getting poked back? <laughs> Your assumption is that at four, I would have stabbed someone. Thank yes. you. Thank you. I mean, there's there's good parts to that characteristic. Uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out, little bitch. <laughs> Very little. Very little. Uh, Four-year-old four little. Um, gotcha, bitch. <laughs> there it is. That's what my teacher said to me on the first day. <laughs> anyway, yeah, my... It was, my, my, it was a summary. power move. It was a power move. <laughs> just to show you who was boss. She stabbed all the kids in that class. Uh, yeah, my memory is just... God awful. Mine is too. I, I mean, do not I, have the problem of not forgetting. I am a, I'm a very gifted forgetter. 
I think for most of us, I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I would say that I would say that most of us in this room or most of us as human beings, I would say the average person okay. has, uh, well, I mean, I feel like when we talk about old memories, we usually think about like, like you remember that cause you got stabbed, <laughs> you know, right. like that's a very specific memory because there's a specific like sensation and moment attached to it. Um, like I feel like a lot of our memories as we get older, the mundane sort of escapes us. Oh, absolutely. And the well, things that stick out are more often the more uh, unique, differentiated. I think uh, it also things. has to has to do with those more unique moments you're going to go back and think about later, or you're going to retell, sure. or are going to impact other things that you do. So you get rejob. So every time I retell that story or remember like oh yeah that was a funny thing or now it's in there as like the first thing that i remember it rewrites it right so now i'm not remembering when it happened i'm remembering the last time i remembered it which is also i mean we're, we're going to talk about memory in a lot of different ways today but i think one of the interesting things about memory especially when you look at uh like eyewitness testimony is how unreliable memory is. And uh, the yeah. thing that you just said is a big reason that is because you see something happen, you tell yourself a story about what happened. And every time you like play ping pong with that memory, it kind of curves back just a hair differently. Each but it time. still remains quote unquote truth, right? Yeah. It's your memory. You know, I, th I do feel like we have this, um, this idea that our memories are infallible. Like if I, if I remember it, it happened and it happened in the way that I remember it. Right. But like notoriously our brains super do not work yeah. that way. Spend They're, 30 seconds with anyone else that experienced the same thing. And yeah. Yeah. No, you were, no, you were, well, I thought we were, you know, like there's so much of that going on. Right. And just and you're probably both wrong. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> you both just have different memories of it, but right. they do, they kind of reshape over time. Well, and it's super subjective too. There is not one correct recollection of an event usually. Yeah. I mean, often I think like, yeah, the, I think the, the eyewitness testimony one that's, that's best is like the stories about people who witness car accidents. And once the police collect reports of, what color the cars were and how mm -hmm. fast they were driving and how many people were in the cars and all that. They get like a bunch of different versions of that and they have to compile, you know, one car accident happened on one intersection with the view in view of, you know, 10 or 15 people whose eyewitness testimonies they got. But those stories all come across a little bit different. It makes me think about what we were talking about last week with the, the Yuba incident stuff. Yeah. Of even just something like reporting, seeing someone, in right. a location where you probably didn't see him. Yeah, did you? <laughs> did or you? or uh, Shones saying he saw two cars and then later second-guessing himself and saying, eh, maybe it was one, it could have been one. I was having a heart attack. Yeah. But even even not under extenuating circumstances like that, just right day-to-day -day stuff. For sure. And then, right, once you factor in the time, yeah, shit can get really weird. Yeah, memory is just sort of inherently unreliable even though obviously there are elements of it that are reliable but there are a lot that also aren't well it's more reliable for some people than others isn't it though so i'm i'm pretty far on the unreliable end of the spectrum but some people are definitely uh, at the other end yeah so one of the one of the things that um sort of i guess spurred this idea for this episode was i stumbled across this really weird not weird that's that's the wrong adjective to use this interesting and sort of strange uh interview with uh with a kid a guy a 20 something british kid named aurelian and uh, Do you know how to spell that by the way it's a u r e l i e n cool um like aura and alien uh but a a for our <laughs> listeners sort of <laughs> except it's a u r e l i e n okay so otherwise it would be aura and alien damn I, you're going to you're going to name a pet that aren't you <laughs> aurelian aurelian it's both <laughs> um i came across this kid in my in my studies as well um yeah so they did a they did a i think it was a bbc documentary was that what it was yeah on this kid uh, called The Boy Who Can't Forget. Um, and so 
Aurelian, do we have that audio pulled up or should we inject that later? Uh, I can pull it up. Yeah, okay. Give me two seconds. Um, I can explain what's happening to Aurelian, but I feel like it might make more sense for us to just play this quick clip so you can get a glimpse into this guy's life and then we can talk a little bit more about what's actually going on. I got you. How could you demonstrate for me what it is that your memory does that maybe mine doesn't? I suppose if someone said what happened, you know, tell me something that happened in like June 2008 and I I could instantly think of things, whereas most people would not be even able to remember, you know, what they were doing in that year. What about the 17th of June, 2008? Um, yeah, I can tell you, that was a Tuesday, and it was the first day after um, I finished my GCSE exams, and my room was an absolute tip, so I had to just clear it all out, and I spent the whole day doing that. I could tell you it was a, quite a nice day. We got sunnier. Um, and we went for a curry in the evening. Um, and I remember watching you swim in with my mum and Jane Rivers got thrown off for, for swearing on live TV. <laughs> yeah. I love I checked BBC the date music. of Joan Rivers' daytime television outburst. He was right. It did occur on Tuesday the 17th of June, 2008. So, Aurelian... Uh suffers from a mental I don't want to call it a disorder a condition let's say a mental condition yeah it's not it's not recognized by the DSM or anything yet as a disorder right because there's well, sorry go ahead no go ahead no go ahead I was gonna, they're like still only 50 or 60 people on the planet that have been thought to have this yeah. condition and uh, the condition uh itself is sort of both hard to diagnose and also there are some people who have varying degrees of it so some people are just like yeah i have a good memory and but actually and it's called what you actually some of these people have what's known as hyperthymesia uh which is the condition of possessing an extremely detailed autobiographical memory people with hyperthymesia remember an abnormally vast number of their life experiences and can recall almost every day of their lives in near perfect detail as well as public events that hold personal significance those affected describe their memories as uncontrollable associations when they encounter a date they see a vivid depiction of the day in their heads and their recollection occurs without hesitation or conscious effort that is the wiki Pedia definition of hyperthymesia. And this is a fairly recent discovery, so to speak, right? Yeah, actually after um, so maybe the most popular person who suffers from hyperthymesia, her name is Jill Price. She was known as AJ when she was first being studied uh, because she didn't want to give her real name. Uh, the team at the University of California Irvine were the ones who studied her brain initially because she has hyperthymesia as well and can recall a whole bunch of shit. Um, but only about herself. Yeah, or about things that she's seen or experienced. So, you know. But if you gave her a set of numbers or something to memorize, she wouldn't be able to or not any more than anyone else? Not any more than anyone else. Her her uh, her recall memory in the way that you and I have to like remember our grocery list when we go to the grocery store yeah. is basically the same. Okay. But her autobiographical memory of her lifespan is super wicked intense and like super detailed. So Jill's case came to the attention of the university of California in 2006 was when the first study on her brain was published. And she, she went to them, didn't she? Um, just to seek out help more or less. Cause yeah, it was actually affecting her life. So severely like, is this normal or is this super abnormal mm -hmm. or what's going on with me? Um, and over time, um, some, Older cases have kind of come up based mm. on so there's a there's a report of a guy named Daniel McCartney who was born in 1817. Um, Damn, yeah, he's still uh, out here. Yeah, no, he's super oh. not still out here. He <laughs> died in 1887. Let's maybe talk about the fact that there's a 200 year old man <laughs> instead of the fact that he can remember shit. No, um, but he he was born in Pennsylvania in 1817 and. Um, he was famous for his mental ability in that he remembered every single day of his life from the age nine until his death 
And given specific dates, he could give the day of the week, describe weather, describe what he did, what he ate, and could provide details of local, regional, and national events on that day. Um, so he had been sort of a guy who uh, who um, showed these symptoms, these same sort of, I don't know what you would call it, this condition that Jill Price had. But that didn't exactly come to light until her case was more widely known. People made an association with that kind of disorder or condition. It's not a disorder, I guess. Well, well we can get into that in a second. She, I think she would describe it that way. It's been more <laughs> detrimental than helpful. Right. I wanted to... Uh, we were talking about this off air before we start, but I want to bring it up because it's come up twice already with the day of the week thing. Yeah. Because uh, Aurelian started with when the guy gave him whatever the date was. I already forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. July 17th, 2008, I believe was what it was. Okay. So, and he said it was a Tuesday. Yeah. Oftentimes, people who have hyper. I always fucking pronounce it wrong. Hyperthymesia. Hyperthymesia. Yep. Uh, We'll start out by saying, well, it was a Wednesday or it was a Friday and then pausing and then thinking about what happened, which makes me more than a little skeptical because that's something that in a couple steps you can calculate pretty easily. Yeah. So if you take the last, I just looked it up. If you take the last two digits of the year, so you said it was 08. Uh, was the date he was given? Yes, 08. Or, okay. June of 2008. And then it says divide by four. But what do you do if it's not divisible by four? Eight is divisible by four. But I mean, what would you do in the situation if it were not? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, and then it says add the day of the month and then add the month's value as in six would be June. So, yeah. Like, I know that there's a mnemonic anyway, device to do this. Within yeah. within four or five pretty easy steps, you can figure out the day from any, if you know the the date. Um, which just makes me a little skeptical because, like, you're saying that and it's immediately impressive that you can do it. It also gives me no information about what happened that day. Although the instance that we just played of of Aurelian recalling that date had a specific instance about a television show event that he remembered, yes. which was able to be confirmed by the interview. True. True. So there so I completely agree that there are there are elements of this that do seem like people are uh potentially calculating things, but the from what we understand about hyperthymesia, which admittedly is not a lot, uh, to refer back to the wiki quick, it says, despite being able to remember the day of week on which a particular date falls, hyperthymestics are not calendrical calculators like some people with autism or savant syndrome. Rather, hyperthymestic recall tends to be constrained to a person's lifetime and is believed to be a subconscious process. As in, if you were to ask Aurelian or Jill about... Uh, the 40s or the 50s before they were born, they wouldn't actually be able to recall the day of the week from that time because they don't oh. actually have a memory of it. So Granted, you're saying they could fake it and be like, right. I'm not, I don't know. But you're saying it's coming, <clears throat> it appears to be coming from recall rather than calculation. That's the way that it comes sure, across sure. is that, is through that. Is there any link between that hyperthymesia and autism? So, Maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, if we had a sample of more than 50 people, maybe there would be. Yeah. And again, that's the hard part is like, there isn't a ton of, um, there isn't a ton of sort of centralized research about it all. Well, and there's not that much data you can really gather or variables you can eliminate if your sample is that small either. Exactly. Um, but one of the big things that, uh, that they talk about is that um, some of the, so we're going to get a little scientific on it right now, but the uh, the frontostriatal system that, is... Is that in your brain? Yeah, it's yes. a section of your brain. Yes. Yes. I'm with you so far. Nailed I it. I bet it's in the front. It is in the... <laughs> Boom. Okay. Boom. Keep going. Um, that, uh, that system basically... When, when they look at people's brains who have hyperthymesia, thymesia, there are some overlapping areas of stimulation that occur with people with autism 
OCD, ADHD, Tourette's, and schizophrenia. So there are parts of those people's brains Yikes. that light up that are not dissimilar from those uh, those places. Is that I've worked with a lot of people with autism, and I've noticed some not to that degree. Yep. But I've worked with people who will like on a day to day basis recall and like fret over things that happened 10, 15 years ago. Right. And bring it up in conversation. Like it just happened because the recall is that close for them that they can just pull it back up. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's no, there's no separation between something that happened yesterday and something that happened 10 years ago and something that happened five years ago. And and back to a really early age sometimes too. Sure. The, and and it seems like for most of the people who have hyperthymesia, it somehow starts at a, at a pretty young age. Um, to your point that I think is really interesting. So they uh, this article talks about some of the, the causes, which again are pretty not very well known. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but um, Jill Price says... Um, Uh, this is a quote from her. She says, it's like a split screen. I'll be talking to someone and seeing something else, which I feel like um, we don't want to speak for you, but I would imagine some of those kids in those cases have some similarities of the, like part of them bringing up something from a long time ago is them feeling like it's very present, maybe not visually in a split screen format, but maybe it's that close to them that it feels like it's Mm -hmm. able to influence. Yeah, I, I, I guess the one difference from, and obviously I'm not in any of these people's heads, so I, I'm speculating, but it seems like with the the people with autism that I've worked with, it's it's not um, it's not predicated by some sort of external input that reminds you of something that happened. It's yeah. more of like this internal running uh, loop almost. Yeah. They- Whereas with with Price, it sounds more like she'll see something that will remind her of something else, and then she'll get a visual image of that memory. Yeah. And she has so many memories stored up that almost anything that she sees or hears or smells or tastes will trigger a memory. So she has this constant visual running split screen thing. Right. Where she's in the moment, but it's constantly triggering past memories too. Totally. And one of the things that I find really interesting about that, um, they they talk about the difference between uh, what they call semantic memory and episodic memory. So your semantic memory is the things that you just know, like the things that you know in your brain. You don't have to recall them. They're just things that you know. Not tied to a specific event? Um, or? Not necessarily, but it's like... Um, like I know my shoe size, but it's yeah. not tied to the day that I learned what size shoe I wear. That's a good. That's a good version of it. Okay, you don't have to recall. Like you know your shoe size in a way that you don't have to recall. Like you don't I'm, have to go. Hmm. What was what? I'm what not, did they I'm not thinking back today? to a specific incident. Right. It's just something that is <clears throat> probably permanently in there. That's your semantic memory. Okay. And your episodic memory are the things that you have to recall. Where it's like a month ago, I bought a size of. A pair of size 12 shoes. Yeah. And they looked like this. And I bought them from this store. And what day of the week was that? And what mall was I at? And all All those things that I never remember. Right. Yeah. Um, But um, the difference between those two memories is is sort of important to the way that they understand this because people, uh, people who, I guess, suffer from it is the right word, maybe, or uh, have Have the condition. Yeah. I I don't know. Possess hyper. Jesus, I'm going to stop trying to say that word. <laughs> Prithymesia. Um, often, often exhibit a sort of a side-by-side of both in that mm-hmm. they're, they're, the way that their brain is actually firing in the moments of them reacting to mm-hmm. things, they're firing from both of those memory centers. So it's almost so the, like they know things and they're recalling them at the same time. Or the semantic memory is constantly triggering episodic memory. Yes, exactly. And that's also too why you can hear in that Aurelian example that we played for you, 
he says, he says, so for instance, and the kids just like casually being like, I don't know, you'd like what's the difference between me and you? I don't know. I could maybe know something from June of 2008. And the guy gives him a date and the kid fires back. Oh yeah. That was the day this happened. And he remembers the Joan Rivers thing. Like yeah. it all kind of, he's recalling, okay, so that was the day that I finished that. But he, it's almost like he knows that that's the day that the Joan Rivers thing happened. He's not he's not even unsure of it almost. It comes from a sense right. of like knowing. And and one of the interesting things about that too, that I think is, is kind of fascinating is some of the studies on it have been connected to uh, synesthesia mm. or the brain actually reacting synesthetically. So if you in don't- that the, the processes in the brain are similar to people who have synesthesia or that people who have synesthesia also have hyperthymesia? Um, in that- um, uh, more so neither of those and more so <laughs> that people over two <laughs> no but it, uh, I see where you're headed where, where you were headed with that but but really it's more like the way that I understand it from what I read is that um, that synesthesia so for those of you who don't know what synesthesia is I guess we should explain it it's it's basically conflating senses so you might hear colors or you might see sounds when I when I was a kid getting into music and playing in bands and starting to record music and stuff. My, my brother is four years older than me. He kind of got me into all that stuff when I was like nine, 10. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I didn't figure out until much later in life why we had such a hard time communicating about some of it because he would describe sounds as colors. And I was always like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. The guitar is not green. I don't know what that means. Do you mean distortion? Is distortion green? What the fuck are you talking this is about? Not helping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so he like certain tones had color associations to Damn. him. Yeah. Yeah. And I like didn't know until much later in life that that's what that is and that it's something that happens. But yeah, it's it's having one sense present as another. So you may identify sounds as colors or tastes might have a uh, uh that's a bad example no it's not though i mean taste could also have a color like or salty tastes could might be yellow to you sounds or, associated with them or yeah a lot of people see yeah sound as color is one of the most common ones i think yeah but uh um, crossing of senses basically the, yeah the crossing of senses and so uh one of the things that i read is that some of the studies have um basically said that there's a possibility that some of these people are experiencing time as a sense in a synesthetic way. So oh. almost their memory is, uh, it, it's hard to explain, but I guess the way that I understood it is that the way that people are recalling is almost like a, like a, like a sixth sense kind of like their recall is another thing. Dude, just quick tangent. Uh, sure. Uh, no, I, I've never seen Sixth Sense. No, I wasn't going. For all of you. You really haven't? No, but I know how it ends. Oh, uh, dude, I just, that triggered a great memory for me, by the way. <laughs> um, no, I've gotten so deep into the, the time travel shit in the last, like, couple weeks. Oh, yeah. Since we started kicking this around. Yep. That's going to be like a nine-part <laughs> episode, just heads up heads up everyone we're gonna do nine episodes on time travel <laughs> and it's gonna be just me talking the entire time <laughs> so i'm gonna be going no way no way oh really oh, that's they made up. what disappear where <laughs> interdimensional bigfoot came through a portal <laughs> in new york what that's fucked up man that's anyway. disrespectful uh synesthesia as related to time is the craziest thing i've heard of at least today yeah and word. that's really dope yeah for sure uh, pharrell there, there's some stuff out there about Pharrell talking about synesthesia because that's a thing that he has. Pharrell is that sinist, sinist. Probably relates to him being one of the best musicians of our generation. <laughs> might help, just might help. Um, yeah, actually, I think, uh, yeah. So, uh, hy hyperthymestic individuals um, appear to have poorer than average memory for arbitrary information, but better than average memory for. Oh wow their sort of their own personal lives and random cultural facts. Um, a striking parallel has been drawn between cases that exemplified an interesting case of synesthesia. And it has been suggested that superior autobiographical memory is intimately tied to a time space synesthesia. So time and space are things that you can sort of like conflate as senses. They're the same thing, bro. Corey Einstein. Well, there's that. 
There is that. That's why time travel is possible. Because we're telling you. Because we're literally time traveling right now. Well, because time and space are are one. Mm. Einstein proved it. Interstellar. He done scienced it to be fact. <laughs> he done scienced it into reality. Sometimes you don't think things be the way that they be, but they be. <laughs> what is that? A, that's an that Einstein for? quote, I think. See, he's talking about space and time. That's how he wrote all his papers. Yeah, he was on the train shooting bullets at stuff, and people were looking at it. <laughs> right? Isn't there something about that in there? Science I, brought I read, to you by Spencer and Ryan. I read all that stuff when I was like too young to really understand it because I was like, I'm going to be smart and I'm going to read this Stephen. I don't know why that, that's how I talked. You from Minnesota. the South when you were <laughs> yeah. a child? What the fuck? I know you weren't. I was You're from in, here, bro. I was born about as far north as you can be in the United States. Uh, and then like, so I have these vague memories of some things that maybe Stephen Hawking or Einstein wrote, but I was like 14 when I was reading it. And so didn't you don't actually know which underst- is which? I didn't, well, no, I didn't actually understand <laughs> oh, any of right. it. And now I've just, as an adult, have never gone back to any of it. Yeah. So like I read in 1984 when I was like 12. Yeah, 13 or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And it just seemed like weird and creepy and I liked it. And I was like, look at me, I'm smart. I'm, I'm reading smart. this book. <laughs> That was when I went to I went to middle school in the south for a while. Yeah, that too. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that your leftover memory of Einstein and all of his theories is wasn't there like bullets in a train? I, th- yeah, right. There's wasn't some, there's there some a that- Fast and Furious movie somewhere <laughs> on this? Maybe maybe that was Wild Wild West. I might have been watching Wild Wild West. Ooh, let's all go Big watch Wild Wild West. I have seen Wild Wild West. Um, one gonna- one no wait 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 okay. one last thing on yeah, the yeah. hyperthymesia. Yes, sir. Now that I can pronounce it, you nailed it. Thirty five minutes into the podcast, you nailed it. <laughs> I can pronounce the thing we're talking about. You nailed it. Um, you mentioned OCD. Mm-hmm. And the more I dug into Jill Price's stuff, particularly, yes, it seemed like it may, it definitely is related to OCD. Yeah, and I might go as far as to say the a lot of it is an expression of OCD. Yeah, because one thing that we left out when talking about her specifically, and this doesn't apply to Aurelian or some of the other cases necessarily, but she has journaled in depth daily about her her own life what she does every day yep since the 70s and she has 50,000 pages of journals that she still has and she sort of obsesses over her own memory right and has a com- uh, there's an article from wired in oh back in 2009 it's sort of like the defining profile on her yeah and one of the reasons that she stopped talking to the press for a long time because it she thought it portrayed her very negatively but i think it's worth adding to the conversation yeah um it was written by a professor of psychology f- whose name was is gary marcus yep um and he said quote she still has every stuffed animal she's ever gotten um she has 2000 videotapes and countless audio tapes and fifty more than fifty thousand pages of diary entries, so dense, written so densely that it's almost unreadable. Until recently, she owned a copy of every TV guide since the summer of nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, I'm not sure Price wants to catalog her life like this, but she can't help herself. Right, and so it just got me thinking about if I kept detail record detailed records at the end of every day about what I did that day and had constant visual reminders around of things that I had done throughout my, like a a constant continuous line of visual reminders of everything I had done for the last 20 years. Yep. My memory would be very different as it relates to myself and my experiences. And I wonder how much that plays into it. And, and, and she counters with, well, I don't go back and read them. Yep. It's really more of a coping mechanism to help try and get some of this stuff out of my head so I'm not constantly fixated on it. Which I understand which the also, concept Which of also I makes sense. That. Right, yeah. right. I mean, I can see both sides of that. Right. But I know for myself, even the process of writing something down, even if I never go look at it again, helps me remember that information better. It's scientifically proven, too. That's why they tell kids to take notes. Yeah. Even if you don't study your notes, it actually helps you retain the info. And then after a while... If you know I'm going to or have to, if, if we're talking compulsions, I have to write down what I did at the end of each day. Right. You're going to be more tuned in throughout the day, too. Sure. And you get into a habit of recalling a few things that you did every day for years. 
And she maintains in her interviews too that split screen thing that I was referring to earlier. It's almost like she's living her life in one pain of her split screen and the other pain of the split screen is her following the rabbit hole of associative memory that she can just totally go down and and find all of that information again. Mm -hmm. So to your point earlier about like uh, reciting a memory back to yourself, reaffirming it in your brain, she says that the way that her days go, she's basically 50 50ing that her entire life. So she's constantly and that's, running down the rabbit hole of her memory while she's creating new memories, which is then reaffirming all of her sort of past memories that she's combing through over and over. That being said, there are some days and times that I still don't think you can fully attribute to her 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 living in that space, but I totally feel what you're saying. It's something that Marcus brings up in that article too. He says, um, I'm just going to read the whole quote. Price may display unusually complete recall of her own past, but her memory is the same blurry patchwork as everyone else's. Mm. The difference being that she scans her past relentlessly. Every time we think about something, and especially how it connects to something else, we get better at remembering it, a phenomenon that psychologists call elaborative encoding. Mm. So basically, it's exactly what you were saying. You're rewriting those connections every time. Right. And for her, it's constant. It's all day, every day. And so new experiences are constantly being tied back to old ones. Right. Old experiences are being connected to each other. She's reviewing them all the time, whether she wants to be or not. Right. I'm not saying it's intentional or that she's trying to like pull one over on anybody. Right. But the way her brain works, whether it be due to hyperthymesia or OCD or something else or a combination of a lot of things. Right. He, his conclusion is, he says, the truth is most people could remember their lives in considerable detail if they contemplated them with the same manic intensity. Mm. So he attributes, attributes it mostly to the fact that she is keeping such detailed records right. and then constantly running them back in her head, right. which most of us just aren't compelled to do. Totally. Because it's not a productive thing to do. And she talks about, you know, she says, this has ruined my life. Yeah, no, she's she's pretty transparent about the fact that this is not a blessing. Mm -hmm. She's not excited about it. Like, like there's a bunch of um, there's a bunch of interviews. I mean, we won't play all like the instances of her recalling random dates and times, but go on YouTube; they're everywhere, and you can find them. But uh, there's one interview uh, she did with Diane Sawyer in 2020 where she talks about the fact that she remembers all of like the wrong things she's done in her life. And, and like, we all, we all remember some bad ones where we're like, if I had that one back, I'd do that differently. But she pretty much maintains that like, she has a catalog of every time she's wronged a person in her life. And that those things are like alive and present and that she feels the associative emotions with those wrongings pretty much every Dude, time I, she jumps into them. I worked with uh, a young man with autism for a long time and he would constantly be thinking about stuff like that. Yeah. And it would be something like, it could be a conversation that happened four, year, four years, four years, ago, years ago, ago. And he would say, you know, we'd be waiting for his bus or something. Do you think I should have said this instead of what I said? And I'd have to be like, wait, what? Yeah. Who, who, where, when, I'm what are we right talking about? Like, here, right? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not in the same place that you are right now. Yep. And he would be just running back awkward conversations from years ago in his head to be like, oh, I should have said this thing. Wow. And then for someone with autism who struggles a lot socially, there were many of those interactions and it was right. something that like he was trying to learn, he was trying to improve on. Right. Like, and how so can it was like better front of his time. mind a lot of the time anyway. Right. But it would be the same thing where it would be like almost debilitating remembering and reprocessing old stuff yeah. to the point where now you're not present here and now for sure you're four years ago in california totally you're you're not here in in minnesota yeah. with me right now yeah and yeah I, and it sounds like it was to a lesser extent than what somebody like jill price is experiencing but right i can totally understand how that would be it would make it impossible to live your life after a while honestly too man like as somebody who suffered from anxiety for many years and still like dips into it and like I ha was medicated for anxiety for a period of time in my early twenties, like I, I 
I have, like, I've never been OCD or anything like that, but I have periods of time in my life where I remember being like, I was so aggressively focused on mistakes made and past things that like I was finding it hard to be present in the real world, you know? And I think that, um, that can come from all kinds of things that can come from traumatic events that can come from all kinds of stuff, which for price it does too. Her her memory was not always like this. It was triggered by a traumatic event early in her life too, which just makes it all the more interesting really yeah definitely that 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 can be something that in the 2020 interview uh diane sawyer asks her she says something to the effect of do you feel like you're hoarding memories and she says i don't like the word hoarding which well might be because she feels like it cuts a little too close to the bone yeah uh because of like spencer said her physical uh accumulation of things as well as her mental accumulation of things. I mean, it, it is. It's mental hoarding, yeah, really. Right. Not intentionally, though, which, well, I, I don't think any hoarding is really, in, I don't know. Yeah, Intentional is not the right word. I would say that. I would she say acknowledges that, that it's a problem. Compulsive. It's yeah, com- there we go. It's, it's there compulsive we go. more than it is intentional, I think, would be maybe That's the, the right word. The yeah, difference yeah, yeah, I would for use. Sure. Um, yeah, man, I honestly, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. And I feel like I've felt moments of it, even in the slightest, and those moments are terrible. So to be yeah. able to not escape from it sounds like a nightmare, kind of. But it also doesn't sound like that's everyone's experience. Like the uh, no. Aurelian seems like he, it doesn't really inconvenience him most of the time. Yeah, he, he, he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't have the same level of, uh, I would say, emotional attachment to well, it. Well, and in that, in the documentary about him, they show him watching and reacting to a, a video of Jill Price. Mm-hmm. And he says something like, Oh yeah, I don't it's I don't experience it as intensely as she does. Yeah, word. Or something you know, something along those lines. Yep. So it seems like something that even within this very small subset of people, there's still a spectrum right. to it and your own experiences in your own brain are obviously gonna influence how you how it presents. Right. But. And the depth and intensity to which it does. We should take a break real quick and yeah, then come back do. and talk about some slightly more fun stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, fascinating, though a little bit intense. But yeah, we, we've got some some wilder and crazier and more fun stuff uh, coming up right after this. This episode of the What If Podcast is brought to you in part by Button Poetry. Check them out right now by visiting buttonpoetry.com. Button Poetry is nothing like the traditional poetry you heard in high school, and they're certainly not the same old, boring dead guys that are going to put you to sleep. Button Poetry features poets of all ages, races, sexual orientations, and backgrounds, and as a poetry press and an online destination, for spoken word and slam poetry videos, Button Poetry publishes poetry that moves people. They believe that real current stories and real current voices are more necessary now than ever. You know, everyone says changing the world with art is impossible, but at Button Poetry, they're sure going to try. So check out everything they have to offer. There's books, there's videos, there's commentary, there's learning, there's education. There's so much stuff uh, that you can get by checking them out at buttonpoetry.com. Today, you will fall in love with poetry all over again, or maybe for the very first time. Content and there was a chance see, like, you could see some blurred out titties. You got to see like half a titty once yeah, in a while. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're uh, we're back, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, who me? <laughs> well, I get to see half a titty. Who me? Oh man. Oh. That break might have been too long. Sorry about that. Hey guys. guys. <laughs> Spencer and I had to take care of a little bit of business over the break. Oh, boy. And by that, we mean watching Howard Stern videos on YouTube. (laughs) Three weeks later. That's what business looks like around here. (laughs) Three weeks later. We should do that sometime. We should try to pick up an episode multiple weeks later and just, like, see. (laughs) Can we do it? Test our memories, if you will. There you go. Um, Uh, Speaking uh, of testing your memory. Yeah, I want to talk about the most fun kind of memory 
Oh man, are you gonna talk to us about Derek? Yeah, dude. Dude, Derek, Derek. is my guy. I watched so much shit about Derek. Uh, Paravani, Parav, Paravacini. I can't say anybody's name or any. You having a hard time today, bro? You know. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, me. Uh, um, Derek Paravacini. Can we spell it for the people? D E R. Not Derek, bro. <laughs> Well, actually, that could be D E R R I C K, but it's not. It's, it's D E R E K, P A R A V I N C I. Pedavinci, Pedavinci, I I don't fucking I can't read. All right, <laughs> you forget you forget how to read. I just can't uh, spell P A R A V I C I N I. Yeah, Paravicini. Paravicini. There right. we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. Um. So who's Derek? He's a uh, British lad. Well, now he's now he's thirty seven, I suppose. He was a British lad. You can see his wiki picture. I'm pr- I know. I'm his- laughing that you used the word lad oh. in relationship to a British man. I think this is the first time lad has been used on the show. Well, uh, his wiki picture is very strong, by the way. In case you do come across it, uh, yes, very strong. You should all Google him instantly. Derek uh, was born three and a half months early. And he weighed one and a half or one pound, five ounces. Oh my gosh, really? One pound, five ounces when he oh was born. Oh my gosh, wow, and that's he was, insane. He was a twin and his twin did not survive. So he was a twin who already like, probably usually twins are a little smaller and then was born three and a half months early. Uh, he was born blind. He had some developmental disabilities and was later diagnosed with autism. So he had all kinds of wow. struggles right out of the gate. At two, he started playing piano, and that, I mean, that has to, uh, that has to be, two-year-olds don't play the piano. Like, it's no. just, like, not a thing that happens. No. He, uh, his nanny, they had, like, a little keyboard in the house, and she was just trying to find something to, like, keep him busy one day, and sure. gave him a keyboard, and he started playing it, and he was so small, still at two years old, that he couldn't, like reach a lot of the keys and stuff so he played using all of his body like he would use his hands but he was also using his elbows to hit the higher and lower keys whoa and he would like duck his head down and hit notes with his nose when he couldn't reach stuff wow yeah and he was blind so he's doing this all by feel yeah right yeah he also can't see wow um and by the time he was four he had built up a repertoire of like 40 or 50 songs that he had either written or taught himself on the piano by hearing music that other people would listen to. Jesus. Mm -hmm. And his technique was all, you know, insane and unique to him. Um, but he was not being taught. He just, was just like touching a piano. Right. Wow. Um, but by the time he was like four or five, his parents got him working with a piano teacher who he then has worked with, I think for the rest of his life. Um, and he also has absolute pitch or what is commonly called perfect pitch, meaning that if any note is played, he can instantly identify what note it is. I have a very ignorant question. Yeah. How how does a piano teacher teach someone who's blind? How, like, I feel like without the complement of music to be able to explain, like sheet music to be able to explain mm. something, it seems... It seems different. I guess you would you'd well, be instructing like hand hand placement and yeah. And where this ties into memory is that Derek's recall is such that if he hears a song once, he can not only recall it later, but he can almost instantly play it. And so I think a lot of the instruction was just things like technique because sure. he was self taught and had had never. S- literally never seen anyone else play piano. So it was entirely by feel. And so a lot of it was, I think just correcting technique. Um, and he literally didn't need sheet music. Right. Because he could just memorize something after hearing it once. I he's, didn't believe he's also this. like, he's pretty, his disability is pretty severe. Yeah. Um, his, his language capabilities are very limited. He needs like one-to-one help to do just sort of basic stuff throughout his day. Um, so I, I think he would have been pretty limited in what he could have learned from a teacher in the first place. Right. Um, but yeah, anyway, he has perfect or absolute pitch. So if he hears a note 
he instantly knows what no it is. I was watching a video today of him he's riding a train somewhere in, in London. Tight. And he as the train is speeding up, he's naming what note like the the sound of the tr- uh the the train on the track is Get making. The fuck out he's of like, here. F sharp, G, G sharp. As the train is going. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Get the fuck out. Um. And I learned today that so perfect pitch is really rare in people just in general. Explain. Explain it to me. Okay. So explain it to me. Uh, perfect pitch would mean that if I were to walk up to a piano and just hit a key without looking, you could say, oh, that's an A or, oh, that's C sharp. But that's only, so perfect pitch is only available to people who have studied music then, right? Because you'd have to know like what a note is. Right. Um, But it doesn't require, so some people that have studied music for a really long time can have what is called a relative pitch. So for instance, if I were to play an A and say, this is A, and then play any other note, you could then tell me what that second note is because you have that frame of reference. Sure. The difference with perfect pitch being if I just walk over to the piano and hit any random note, you could tell me instantly that's B flat. But can a lot can a lot of like general music people do that? I mean, I feel like a choir teacher can be able to pick a note and say that's a mm, C it's, it's, or like whatever. It's less than one percent of the general population. What? Yeah. You want to guess? B. No, that was A. So if I tell you that's A. E. C. Damn. Yeah. So somebody that like actually studies music and has done ear training and interval training and stuff could get that second one, but less than 1% of people would be able to just be like, oh, that's E flat. But what mm-hmm. I learned today is that 57% of blind musicians have perfect pitch. Doesn't Mason have perfect pitch? I don't think so. I've definitely heard you play things before and he's like told you what it is. Yeah. But while we're playing music. So yes, he's, so there's context, you know what I mean? Yes, I see. Um lots of good musicians have relative pitch. So an isolated note out of nowhere across a, a, car, a huge scale what a is A car it? drives by and hits their horn. What that, note is that's that? That's F sharp. Got it. Yeah. Most car horns are in C, by the way. No way. Yeah. Is that a real thing? Yeah. Dude, I want a, <laughs> I want, I want a car horn that's like D flat or like D sharp, just like a really ugly, awful note. Also, the uh, the Mac startup noise, C major chord. That that doesn't entirely surprise me. Basic ass chords. Basic ass chords. <laughs> be like an A flat minor ninth. <laughs> Give me something dope. Also, make people can like feel like a level of intensity when they open their computer up. So anyway, perfect pitch, way more common. The majority of blind musicians have perfect pitch. Sure. Which is crazy. And I was digging more into why that might be today. And uh, the closest I could get is that your brain doesn't waste neurons. And so if you have neurons that aren't being used for something, like for your sight, for example, your brain is able to reroute them to another sense what? And so is that a real thing? I, according to some guy that had the PhD after his name on YouTube today. He wins. Um, He's got I more mean, letters after a, his name than I a, do. It might have been a PhD in like, I, I don't know, fucking sports science or something, <laughs> but I'm going to believe him. Uh, yeah, you can basically like overclock your other senses because you're rerouting resources from senses that aren't being used. I guess, like, intuitively, I've kind of assumed that that is the case for people who... Not not that specifically, obviously, but... I think we all have seen anecdotal examples of that. Right. Elevate, elevation of senses when one is not being used. The uh, the guy who uses echolocation. You ever seen that dude? Oh, yeah, the bike riding guy. Who yeah, does, the blind like, guy who can ride bikes and do all... They call him the Batman, right? Because he, like, clicks and pops he basically and makes, uses, like, weird sounds He basically uses sonar to replace his sight. Yeah. Yeah. And he, like, bikes... To yeah. and from work every day through busy streets and shit, and he literally can't see. Yep. 
but he can he clicks at stuff and then based on how it ref- reflects back to him can identify what types of objects they are and size and distance and all that stuff it's absolutely incredible what i didn't know and what i don't really understand why this is about 30 percent of people with autism have perfect pitch hmm. and there's not i don't know there doesn't seem to be as clear of a connection with that one it must be a way that the brain sorts and i mean not to get like whatever but like saves information or yeah, can recall information i mean i don't know because it's recall right i mean that's just perfect pitch is essentially yeah, i can hear that exact, and it matches something in my brain you have an exact memory of what each note sounds like somewhere right. in, in your memory yeah. right um so and, he's both which yeah Double, there, double whammy? I would guess if you're blind and have autism, there's a very high chance that you, and if you study music, a very high chance that you'll have perfect pitch. Right. Anyway, so that combined with his general, like, really intense ability to recall has led him to be able to, um, if he hears a piece of music once, to be able to instantly reproduce it, but also reproduce it some up to years later. So if he hears a song on the Man. radio or if he s- hears someone else play a song on piano or anything from, he's now, I think he's like 37, any song he's heard, he can sit down and play it. And because he has perfect pitch, he doesn't even have to figure out what key it's in or any of that stuff. He can he just, just sit down goes. and play. So I found this clip today of, um, it's him with a bunch of professors of music at some school in, in England. And, the, the hard part of testing his recall is that because he remembers everything he's ever heard, unless you're playing something that he's never heard before, you're not testing his recall. You don't know what he's actually pulling from memory or what he's actually right. just learned a moment ago. Right. God. So in order to test it, you basically have to play original compositions for him that no one has heard before, or you can be certain that he hasn't heard before. I would be I would be such a butthole. I would, I'd be the guy who gets on a piano and be like, whack, walk, walk, wink, bark, 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 and just okay. like hit a bunch of dumb shit. And so, <laughs> I, I, dude, oh, I, was, man. I was listening to a, a podcast today about him, and they tested that because somebody pa- did it. Part of what they were trying to figure out was how much of it is sonic composition. Yeah, because at this point now he's he's done nothing but play music for thirty years. Right. So he's also just a very skilled musician. Right. And has very good instincts for how music is put together. Sure. And so they were trying to figure out how much of it is just this flat out recall ability and how much of it is all the skill he's developed as a musician. Sure. Like if I can identify the key and the measure. Well, and he's also, and I mean, he's fami- familiar with a bunch of different styles too. So, oh, okay, this is a blues piece. I can improvise my way to 60% of what that's supposed to sound like. Sure. Even if I don't recall it perfectly, I kind of know what should be here. Yeah. So if you can do 50% improvisation and 40% recall, you're at 90% of a song. Yeah. You just reproduced. And then somebody listening to it, who's not a trained musician probably isn't going to notice that 10% difference anyway. And go, he's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what, except, (laughs) well, his, his, uh, his teacher also happens to be a, professor at i don't know some english university and so what he did with them is he would sit them down they'd both have midi keyboards so they could track every single note that was being played um if you don't know what a midi keyboard is it's a keyboard connected via usb to a computer and every time you press a note you can record exactly what note was played you know how long it was held for how hard you hit it all that stuff um and so his teacher would play he started out with just a single note. Like, I'm going to play C. Can you play it back? And then he got up to playing 10 note chords. So 10 notes at a time. Obviously, Derek can't see what notes he's playing. He's blind. And he would play back with 93% accuracy the 10 notes that his professor had just played. At the same time. All yeah. 10 fingers pressed down at yes. once. Yes. And then they were doing this with full songs too. And he was like... 40 to 50% accurate with full songs that he had heard for the first time. But that's, again, it's note for note, like no improvisation, no um, no variation in the length of notes, that right. kind of stuff. But when they went to just totally atonal stuff, 
he was only at like 20 to 30 percent oh interesting so his determination was that a lot of it is actually being influenced now by his just ability as a musician and as a pianist so i'm gonna play a piece uh wouldn't you sorry wouldn't you say too though that there's an element of that where well maybe this is the same thing i was gonna say that like the construction of music makes sense from a way of like knowing how it goes but also it makes sense in a way of like sonically it makes sense that's why like certain chords sound good to us and certain ones sound bad to us like instinctually some things sound good right but i agree but some of the like quote unquote chords like the 10 note chords that dude was playing yeah they're essentially 10 random notes it's not like he's playing you know an A major seventh and then just playing it in two octaves. Like he's playing just 10 random and they're like clusters too. They're close together notes that most musicians wouldn't be able to distinguish from each other. Cause you've got a bunch of, yeah, like seven half steps next to each other. It's just right. like, it'd be like if you walk be over a, a piano mess. and just mashed your hand right. down and he can pick out what each individual note is. The craziest thing to me is that's, that even goes, well, I mean, obviously there's recall involved. Like he's, he has, like we were just saying, he has a memory of what a note sounds like and can recreate it by finding it on the piano. But there's a completely additional skill set being, in, being involved here where he plucks something from the sky. And that's, that's where, like with the, uh, <laughs> fuck man, what hyper, hyperthymesia? Yeah. Jesus, why is that so hard for me? I don't know. It's okay. My memory is, is, <laughs> It's not helping. Hyperthymesia. So I think you could kind of summarize hyperthymesia as the memory is being formed in the same way. It's just never being forgotten. Yeah. Whereas with somebody like Derek, it seems like it's being formed in a very different way mm. than most people form memories. Sure. So I'm going to play an audio example. He's hearing, it's a Basque folk song for the first time. So you're gonna hear you're gonna hear the song twice. The first time is Professor playing it, and the second time is him playing it. All right. So this is him hearing the song for the very first time. Derek has never heard this Basque lullaby before, but after just one hearing, how much of it will he be able to remember and repeat? Great narration, Ryan. Thank you. Is that me? <laughs> Derek is a fucking badass. <laughs> Derek's musical ability shits on yours <laughs> and everyone in your families. Okay, right then. Find the pedal then. This is now Derek playing. blind right but he still looks at the camera like are you seeing this shit she's touching my keyboard right now it's almost like please get this bitch off my keyboard <laughs> he's not he's not looking at anything because he's blind but he looks away from her he looks like, like straight into the camera it's yeah. brilliant dude so yeah i mean I've, I've i can tell there are some slight variations in there mostly in the timing i think every note he's playing I'm pretty sure is right. Maybe yeah. the voicings on some of the chords are a little bit different. Yeah. But that's like most of the way to being exactly what he just heard. Right. And the craziest part is he doesn't, because he has perfect pitch, he just walks over and instantly starts playing. He doesn't have to, you know, most, if you took even a very skilled professional pianist, they'd at least have to take a second to figure out what key Find they're your in. place, right. Yeah. He just walks over and starts playing. He can't even see the fucking keyboard. You can actually, if you listen to the audio of that video again, uh, the guy says... He shows him where the pedal is. He says, find the pedal, and he's just like, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> he just starts playing like mid-sentence of yeah. that guy telling him to find the pedal. Yeah. Find the pedal. Nah! <laughs> Got this, bro. I've been doing this shit good as hell. Um, I, I just thought that was a really, like, it, it stood in stark contrast to the stuff we were talking about earlier yeah 
which is equally fascinating to me because, and one thing we didn't bring up earlier is we don't really know anything about what happens when we forget. Yes. We know a decent amount about how we form memories. There's really no research out there about how we forget or why we forget or yeah. when or what we forget. And um, whereas this is like, this dude is forming memories in a totally different way. Right from the average human being. Right. And then on top of that, he's also never forgetting. Yeah. But it's so incredibly, it's, it's the savant syndrome where it's so isolated to playing piano. Yeah. I mean, Spencer showed me a video of this dude in, uh, non musical situations and his, his speech is very restricted. His, the, I, I believe the, the narrator at the point in the video that you played for me said that, he he literally would have difficulties dressing himself yeah. um yeah. without assistance from his his living but but give All... him two pianos side by side and he can play them separately with his left and right hands all of his brain functioning is being put towards playing piano and they in the same documentary that I excuse me that I just pulled that audio from he um they're playing him well-known or to him well-known piano pieces. And it's just like very short snippets, like a, a measure or less. Yeah. And they they have him hooked up to, uh, they have like 30 electrodes on his skull and they're scanning his brain while he's reacting to these. And they're just asking him about every one. Did it end on the right note? So they're taking oh, wow. oh, just a one measure section from, it's like 60 different classical piano pieces that wow. they're pretty sure he's familiar with. Right. And don't worry about any of the other stuff. Just is the last note right. And verbally he was, he was getting like 60, like just over chance, right? 60%, 70%. But when they w looked back at what his brain was doing, every time there was a wrong note, there was a spike in his brain activity. So his disability, wow. his disability is such that his speech can't keep up with what his brain is doing. So his brain is recognizing something that his body can't. But it's being translated to speech incorrectly, or he would sort of, because a lot of, if you watch anything with him, a lot of his speech mimics what other people say. So he'll just repeat what someone has said back to him. Got it. Especially in situations where he's not, totally comfortable or not totally sure of what's going on. Sure. That makes sense. And so I don't know if it's, you know, he was trying to say what he thought he was supposed to say or was just kind of arbitrarily responding because he didn't grasp yeah. the, the language part of it. Yeah. But a hundred percent of the time his brain was recognizing what was correct or incorrect. And that goes back to that whole concept of knowing it's, it's the, in there. It's the knowing memory that is, He's not well, and it's 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 hard to say though. Is because he's so limited in his ability to communicate outside of music. Yeah, it's really hard to know where it's coming from. You can't ask him. Well, what are you thinking about? I mean, you can ask him, but he can't. He can't articulate what what he's thinking about when these things are happening. Yeah. And so maybe who knows? Maybe he is thinking back to the first time he ever heard that piece, or the first time he played that piece, or. We, we don't know how he's forming those memories and why they're so permanent when he does. That's true. I guess what I guess what I was trying to say maybe more was that like if if there's a spike in brain activity every time you hear a wrong note, it's almost like somewhere inside of you intrinsically your body and brain recognizes that something is wrong, well, which is less cuz cuz the recall is the is the one that like actually takes effort, right? So if if it's just coming across his brain and it's striking him off, and that's one that would be hugely influenced by how much you've studied and listened to music too. Yeah, that's real. Because I don't know how much they're being altered. You know, if you're going to a fourth instead of a fifth, it, if you don't know the piece, it would still sound fine. If you're throwing a minor second in there, right? Anybody who's listened to music before is going to be like, "Oh, that sounds that sounds weird." And so you wouldn't necessarily have to. It wouldn't be an exercise in recall necessarily. It would be an exercise in ear training pattern. Which yeah. obviously he has after playing piano in for thirty spades. for thirty yeah. years, days and or hours and hours and hours per day. Right. 
So, but it's just fascinating that like his brain musically and in this one really narrow band is just so far ahead of Everyone. all of his, anyone, but uh, so far ahead of his own functioning everywhere oh, else yeah. too. That too. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I know that's sort of, um, that, that is a, a common trait of people with autism that you have these huge spikes where you may have, you know, especially around, uh, oftentimes math, music, and art, you'll have these huge off the charts abilities and then these huge deficits in other areas. Sure. Um, and he's, you know, he appears to just be a, a really extreme case of that. Um, but yeah, the whole the whole savant syndrome thing, and especially the the you know about the acquired savant syndrome. Uh, this is like, well, go ahead. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, we probably don't have time to get like super deep into it today. Sure. But um, basically, acquired savant syndrome. He usually, usually the uh, the starting point for it is some sort of traumatic brain injury. And like the the one example that I came across today that's pretty well documented is this guy named Derek Amato, um, who he was thirty nine, he was at a pool party, dove in, hit his head on the bottom of the pool, Ugh. and it wasn't anything like super horrific. He got a severe concussion. He went so through, he didn't like just he didn't like break his spinal cord. Or yeah, like, w- within a couple of weeks, physically he was fine. Um, he got. He went to the hospital. He was treated for a concussion. He went home the next day. Like it wasn't anything too severe. He realized five days later that he suddenly knew how to play the piano. He had never touched a piano in thirty nine years, and after smashing his brain around and having a severe concussion, suddenly could play piano. And Explain like, explain it to me, right? <laughs> like not just play, but like play really well. There's um. We're not going to get super in depth, but there's a, if you want to, there's a really great episode of uh, Hidden Brain. I don't know if it, you know that podcast produced by NPR. I have heard of it. I have not listened to it. Um, and they they sat down with him and a, a couple of experts in the field of acquired savant syndrome. But one of the things they do during the podcast is the the interviewer is very skeptical of the whole thing because. It sounds. I am right now. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds impossible, and it would be something that if you wanted to, for whatever reason, you could fake. Sure, you could. You know, hey, I never played piano before, but look at me now. I play piano. Right, says the guy who's played piano for years. Right. Um, but he asks him at one point because this guy only plays music that he writes. Hmm. He can't read music. He's never studied music. He doesn't know anything about it. And the guy asked him at one point, can you play or will you play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star? And the guy is lost. I mean, it's, it's the whole song is five notes. It goes up, it goes back down. Yeah. And he's struggling super hard. He can't find the, the starting pitch. He can't do anything. And the interviewer says to him, try starting on C. Dude does not know where C is on the keyboard. And yet, and yet he's composing and playing and I mean it's not like he's not the world's best piano player by any means but he's a, he sounds like a very competent pianist and he doesn't know where middle C is on the keyboard which so to me that goes like explain it, it to me there we go <laughs> See, we need about 8,000 of those up until now that's Sorry. real no it's okay I just need my own board so that when just fucking do it man i know we're, i know we're working on it i'll get my own board so spencer doesn't control the explain it to me so i can throw them at him whenever i need to um but no like to me that in some ways that almost comes across to me as like uh like like some sort of manufactured recall of like you and i well i guess we don't really count we've listened to and constructed more music than maybe the average person but let's say the average person who has not been in the world of like constructing music or hasn't played in band or bands at all, yeah. but just has like, let's say, you know, a, a, a fandom of music and has enough like radio experience, whatever they've, an, they've an ingested, average familiarity with music. Yeah, yeah. They've ingested an average amount of music in their lifetime. It strikes me as sort of maybe semi-similar to 
not not in other ways, but in this way specifically to Derek's story where it's almost like you can find the thing that sounds right next better than the average person can just based on your level of understanding of the concept. But I, I don't know if you've ever tried to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but like if someone tells you it starts on C and you have any ability to find the note that comes next, yeah, like... Yeah. Right? Right. I didn't know how to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star 10 seconds ago. But I got it right now. But yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I can find the right notes. And this dude is there for like a minute and a half and doesn't ever get there. Yeah. So he has like a way below average ability to figure out what the next note is going to be. Yeah, I guess. So it's all coming from inside of him. I don't know. Ugh, that's weird. Explain it to me. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like right. that's that's the part that's so crazy to me. How can you have this very high end ability without having what we usually think of as being the foundational ability, the scaffolding that allows you to get to the higher ability. Right. It's like being able to have a full blown conversation in another language, but not knowing the very foundational, not knowing any individual vocabulary or words or sure. verbs or like any yeah. any of the structure that allows you to get there. He just somehow right. knows. He skipped over all of the foundation and just somehow knows. It's like it's like being able to write poetry in Spanish, but if I asked you what the word for paintbrush is, you'd be like, I have no fucking idea. Right. I, I can I can write a poem, but I can't right. actually tell you what the words individually mean. Right. The the brain, I think the more I mean, you know, we're going on 40 episodes now and like I feel like the more <laughs> the more that we do this show, so many of these things that we talk about come back to how like we th- we we know that we know some things about the brain, but we know how little we know about the, the brain. The only thing we have to <clears throat> study the brain is our brain. Is our brain, right. We're inevitably forever limited in what we can understand about our own brains. Right. But it's just so it's so fascinating to me like this 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 entire concept is the inability f- to forget, the ability to pluck random facts, the ability to pluck random notes, these these things that are so extraordinary and yet so sort of like mundane in a way. I mean, music is beautiful and great and has given both of us a lot in our lives, but like at the same time, like, you know, it's not transcendent. Like Derek's ability to play the piano will not change the course of humanity in like a... Yeah, you never know. Maybe, but you know what I'm trying to say? Like it's not a... Um, I don't know. It's it's everybody says art can't change the world, Ryan. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Shot, what's up, button? What's up, button? I don't know. I, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean though? You know what I'm getting at? Like the, it's, the it's fact so, that Jill Price knows when the Academy Awards were is not helpful. Yeah, it's to so limited. Humanity. It's so limited in scope. Yeah, that the, 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 the scope limit, I think, is and some it and it, it almost always comes with a cost, too. Yeah. It's like it's offset. Mm-hmm. It's like there's a maximum total capacity, and if you're if you're Oy. building it up in one area, you're taking away from another. I mean, like, I mean, no, this is not a joke, and I mean, no disrespect by this at all. But like, is Stephen Hawking potentially like sort of an example of this? I mean, like, he's well recognized so? because he has a a physical deficit that his is there I mean, a correlation between your physical ability and your mental ability, though? Well, we just sort of cited that there is one between your inability to see with your increased ability to hear and potentially Yeah, but that's notes. from one sense to another. That's a yeah. much more direct correlation than saying, because I don't have physical movement, my other, my other faculties would be increased somehow. No, I get. I see what you mean. I just there. I don't know. I think Stephen Hawking just happens to be really fucking smart, and also happens to be disabled. Yeah, I don't know, but I I guess the concept of there being like a maximum output because he was he was really fucking accomplish. smart before he was disabled too. That's true. I don't think there's any correlation there. Yeah, but just yeah, the 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 idea that the brain can have a maximum output of brilliance. And that that Maybe. can be. I mean, who fucking knows? No, I know, but I'm just saying that the, that concept is fascinating to me. It, it seems like some of these people, 
yeah, that, 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 that it is a challenge. It is not always a gift. Sometimes it is, yeah. is a painful or difficult or, or complicated one. We should probably wrap up. Yeah, we should probably wrap up. Thanks to, uh, thanks to everybody for listening. Uh, if you want to give us a rating or a review, uh, that would be amazing. Uh, one last time, hop over to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you are and uh, let us know what you think of the show. We appreciate you guys so much. Holy shit, there's a lot of you and more of you every week, and that's super fucking cool. So thank you. Yes, and big shout out to all of you that have just been telling friends and random people about it too. Yeah, shout out to everybody in the Facebook group that's adding your friends there and uh, liking us at, uh, on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Um, if you if you have been listening to the show for a while and you want to support us, uh, Spencer and I are trying to make cool shit for you guys every fucking week. So if you hop over to uh, patreon.com slash what if podcast, correct. Uh, there is a Patreon there. We're going to give you guys exclusive content. We've already got uh, some exclusive content on there, some video of us recording. There's a, uh, there's a behind the scenes uh, video of us doing an episode. There's also uh, a, a completely um, unheard episode to the normal listeners of the podcast on there. And we're working on a way to get a lot more stuff for you guys over there too. Yeah, we'll. So yeah, we'll be able we to. Can't quite talk about it just yet. We'll but. update on that in the future. Uh, hopefully, the soon future. And then lastly, if you haven't yet, uh, whatifpodcast.com slash survey. Yes. Uh, just tell us like a little bit about yourself. It really is anonymous. I know you have to give an email, but again, it's literally just to prove We're not that gonna you're do a real person. Shit with it. Um, but it, uh, it, it helps Spencer and I out a lot uh, to be able to uh, get people that uh, want to wanna work with us, work with the show, and, 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 and uh, talk to you guys in a way that you won't be annoyed about. And that might be the only way that we keep doing this long term. <laughs> yep. So that would also be cool. Yep. There is that. <laughs> um, so yeah, what podcast.com slash survey, leave us a rating or review. And also if you ever want to drop us a note, leave us an episode suggestion, uh, hi at what if podcast.com or anywhere on social, you know where to find us. Oh man. I hope you find it. We love you guys. Thanks for being our we'll best friends. See y'all next week. See you soon. Love you. Bye. We'll be back next week with another episode of the What If Podcast. Learn more at www.whatifpodcast.com.